Okay, so I'm going to cut to the chase with this video on Intel's Core Ultra 9 285K. CPU gaming performance. It's a big deal and allow me to demonstrate why with this benchmark. Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. To this day, it's a highly demanding game for both CPU and GPU. But here, even at 4K on ultra settings using DLSS quality mode, we are CPU limited even with what is effectively best of the best hardware. It's interesting to note here that none of these high-end CPUs can consistently clear 60 frames per second for the duration of the entire benchmark. Faster RAM may make a difference, but the G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo DDR5 uh, rated at 6,000 mega transfers per second at CL30, well, it's no slouch. And for this game and many others, we're actually going to be looking at frame generation to break into high refresh rate territory, which is a pretty sobering assessment of the situation. Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah, higher frame rates here, but in the world of 144 Hz and 240 Hz displays, well, 70s and 80s isn't exactly amazing. And yes, we are also CPU limited here. We need more gaming performance. We need vendors to step up. And on paper, the new Intel Core Ultra 9285K looks compelling. We did some productivity benchmarks, uh, but just to prove the point, let's take a look at uh, handbrake video encoding here, something we use practically daily at Digital Foundry. Up against the power-hungry Core i9-14900K, we can see better performance and it's comparable to AMD's Ryzen 9 9950X. Well, AVX heavy HEVC encoding apart. Gaming though, there are problems. Intel's claims suggest we're looking at effective parity with the outgoing Core i9-14900K. A few points off the market leading Ryzen 7 7800X 3D even. The reality though, well, it's puzzling. Something isn't right here. There is very little parity in our tests and instead, well, there's proper regression. Game-changing regression in some cases. Yeah, and I guess this one will be addressed quickly, but, um, well, we're looking at a collapse in performance in Cyberpunk 2077. First up, let's talk about our new CPU benchmarking suite. We'll go into this in more depth at some point, but the basics are clear. We're now fully automated. We have game mods installed for each title that swap in settings configurations. Um, then it boots the game, skips the intros and preamble and gets straight to the benchmarking sessions. Um, the mods use memory pointers to define when to start and stop benchmarking. We can use uh, inbuilt benchmarking sequences if we feel that appropriate. The mods can tap into replay systems like flight simulators if needed, but and here's where we've put in a lot of effort. There are many games where CPU testing requires manual inputs, like Cyberpunk 2077 here, for example, or Baldur's Gate 3, or Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, and yes, Starfield's a keyless CPU hotspot. We automate that too with camera position and player position mods that simulate traversal through CPU heavy areas. So yes, many thanks to our colleague Illusion for working on these mods for us. It means that a very small outlet like Digital Foundry can produce data en masse. Will Judd oversaw the benchmarking for this project and automation basically means more time can be spent on important things like verification and, well, the actual story as opposed to spending the vast majority of the time robotically generating numbers. Let's go back to that collapse in performance in Cyberpunk 2077. The automated circuit of the Cherry Blossom Marketplace sees the 14900K around 45% faster versus 285K. Uh, 7800X3D a touch ahead even of that. 12900K about 28% ahead. 5800X3D much faster still. It's an outlier. It will surely be fixed, right? But I guess the question is, well, if it happens in one title and as high a profile game as this, what other surprises lurk in store in games we haven't tested? We're using 1080p resolution here with DLSS performance mode in order to isolate pure CPU throughput 
in one of cyberpunk's most demanding areas. But let's be clear here. We've designed these tests to apply to real world gaming scenarios. Uh, so yeah, let's rerun that. So let's switch to 4K on the same DLSS performance mode. Alt for RT and well, um, Intel's latest is still way off pace. It's even beaten by a 12600K, believe it or not, based on our testing, which is about eight to nine percentage points ahead. Looking at a game that's more core Ultra 9 friendly, let's move over to Starfield, the classic Aquila run, now fully automated. Uh, this one actually makes good on the PR that Intel was sharing prior to release. 285K is effectively on par with 14900K, and it's ahead of 7800X3D and indeed the freshly rebenched 9950X. This isn't using uh, Intel's new Extreme mode or anything like that. In fact, generally speaking, Extreme Mode barely moves the needle for gaming performance. Everything, I'd say, is just running well. We aren't seeing anything better than 14900K, but Intel has made it clear that performance gains aren't the point. It's looking for efficiency improvements and other benefits outside of gaming. OK, fair enough. Other results highlight that regression with Core Ultra 9 is hardly catastrophic, but well, any kind of gen-on-gen -gen regression at all in performance terms is clearly not a good look. Dragon's Dogma 2. The city is legendarily CPU heavy and our automated player camera path demonstrates what I'm talking about. At 1080p DLSS here, the 14900K about 10 points ahead of 285K. 7800X3D a touch slower than 14900K, but generally speaking across the bench it's still beating 285K though the new Intel offering does pull ahead of the 9950X by around 7 percentage points. Going back to the 12900K, well, the new chip is around 5% ahead, and let's remember this is a 3-year-old processor. Baldur's Gate 3. This one's fun, as it runs very well until about 50 hours into the game, when Act 3 brings you to the city of Baldur's Gate itself. And at this point, the CPU requirement rises dramatically if you're looking for gameplay north of 60 frames per second. We have a 16 point lead for the 14900K here across the whole benchmark, rising to 34% with the 7800X3D. Now let's circle back to Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. OK, so this game can hammer either CPU or GPU depending on the scenario, but let's make this simple. If you're flying at a relatively low altitude over major population centres like London, or as is the case here in New York, you will be CPU limited. So while the tested resolution here effectively eliminates the GPU as a limiting factor, the point is that very similar results occur at higher resolutions too. We're measuring a 15 point lead for the 14900K here, and as Flight Sim loves X3D processors, a 25 point lead for the 7800X3D. Looking at 12900K and 5800X3D, the AMD GOAT is a good 20 percentage points ahead. And even without 3D cache of any description, the 12900K is still inching ahead here. So, I mean, upgrading to a brand new platform is not looking particularly compelling when these oldie but goodie processors are still so competitive to this day. F124 next, and it's fair to say that all processors deliver extremely high frame rates, right? So actual perception of performance differentials to the end user is perhaps less relevant unless you're Max Verstappen, but even so, the numbers are again concerning. It's a 44 percentage point lead for the 7800X3D up against 285K, with the 9950X 25 points ahead. Very similar to the Core i9-14900K if you look at the averages spread across the entire bench. But what's a touch concerning here, from my perspective at least, isn't really the frame rate differential. It's more that the 285K seems to have highly irregular frame times. F124 clearly loves that 3D cache, right? And so it is with the 5800X3D, which monsters the 285K by 34-35%. 12900K, only a five point lead. But look, we're talking about a five point lead from a three year old Intel processor. Okay, so clearly we've got benchmark results that are all over the shop here. There's a lot of inconsistency here. 
but there is some evidence that the products can live up to expectations. So if we look at Forza Horizon 5 here, for example, uh, it's pretty much in line with what Intel was saying pre-release. It's just a shame that we're not seeing more of this. OK, then. Well, I could go on with more benchmarks, but I think the point's been made. So let's wrap things up. First of all, all credit to Will for putting these benchmarks together. These and many more are available on our Digital Foundry at Eurogamer Review, and assuming I actually remember this time, a link will be in the video description below. Uh, beyond that, well, here's the thing with CPU reviews. Benchmarks are inherently highly limited snapshots of game performance. We choose performance hotspots as stress tests, but equally other outlets will be choosing other games and other stress test areas within the games that we are covering. So you may see very different results elsewhere. This is a good thing, actually, as you are seeing a plurality of testing, covering more scenarios, allowing you as a consumer a vast array of data on which to make your purchasing decision. And our recommendation is essentially that there's nothing here from a gaming perspective, at least, that justifies a core Ultra 9 285K purchase. Maybe if fixes, patches and BIOS upgrades come along that deliver results more in line with expectations, more in line with Starfield, basically, then yes, let's bring these chips back into the conversation. Uh, but for now, at least, it's a no from me. OK, then, so please do like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed the content to support what we do here at Digital Foundry. And please consider our supporter program for early access to DF Direct Weekly and other content, news updates from the team and much, much more. But that's all from me on this one. Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Thank <laughs> you.